Welcome to Inside OPSU. I'm Consuelo, the Director of Continuing Education at OPSU's Guyman Classroom. We're here at Pickle Creek Event Center for the 16th Annual Paul Farrell Memorial Art Auction. We'll be interviewing some of the artists and definitely having a great time this evening. artist that we're going to be interviewing is Dustin Martinez. Dustin, thank you for being here, definitely. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where are you from? Uh, I'm actually originally from Diamond, Oklahoma. Uh, I lived in New Mexico in the northern part. Uh, it's called County Lone, New Mexico, uh, for the first four years of my life. And then uh, I moved to Oklahoma, and this is where I've been since. So I kind of like to call this place home, I guess. OK. Um, your major. Tell us what your major is. Um, I'm actually majoring in fine art with um, an emphasis in sculpture. want to get an emphasis in ceramics as well. And uh, maybe go on and get an emphasis in painting. Haven't decided yet on that. But I'm also getting a minor in business too. So. Okay, and uh, you, what do you do on the side? What kind of extracurricular activities are you involved in over at the college? Um, I'm also in the OPSU Halo. Um, I also rodeo, so I'm on the rodeo team. Um, I'm in the Images Art Club, and those are it. That's kind of keep, <laughs> that keeps me pretty busy most of the time. So, anyways. All right, what do you do in the rodeo? Uh, ride What's bulls. Kind of crazy. People call me that, but I love it. <laughs> it and it's kind of, kind of what took me, I guess. So. So why did you select OPSU? Um, I actually went to school here in Guyman, um, and I never had any clue I was ever gonna fall in love with doing this kind of stuff, and. Uh, had a high school teacher that just really kind of got me inspired doing it, you know, and I started as a freshman and I kind of liked it more and more. And I continued to just really like it and get more interested in it and learn more about it. And then they tried to recruit me and I was like, oh, you know, you always hear people say this and say that. Everybody has their opinions, you know. And I just became really good friends with a bunch of people and I went up there more, went up there more, got my parents convinced kind of, you know, that this, you know, that's where I wanted to go and this is what I wanted to do. And it's cool because it's kind of close to home. And I just went and I'm loving it. <laughs> so. Did you ever participate in the Art Jubilee whenever you were in high school here at Guyman? Uh, yes, ma'am, I did actually. Um, I think we were only allowed to do it as a junior and a senior. Um, and I did it both years. Mm -hmm. um, and I. I really enjoyed it. That was kind of also a big thing. I got to see OPSU a lot, and um, it was just allowed me to kind of get that experience of what it might be like up there, but before I actually had to make that decision, you know, so it was good. Right. The Art Jubilee was a really, really good thing. Good. So, well, that's coming up, just so you know. Very <laughs> good experience. Very, very good experience. Okay, I very good. I don't think without that, or I think without that, I probably not really? would have went to Panhandle, yeah, because it really showed me that there was, like, something you can do with art and that it's not just you making art that there's so many other people that do art and produce art out there other than yourself all right so what were the events that you participated in at the art jubilee um just ceramics yep i did uh, i entered one uh wheel thrown piece and then the other was just uh hand built pieces just like this kind of but i uh, i've really grown a lot so it wasn't that nice but <laughs> I've gone a long way. And how'd you do in the Art Jubilee? Um, I've won a few merit awards. Um, I want to say my f uh, junior year and my senior year. I won two or three my senior year and one or two my junior year, I believe. I won them all. So, <laughs> and that kind of made me realize that maybe I did have a little bit of talent and it wasn't as, you know, just so much, hey, I'm making mom a cool little cup to put, you know, in her dill to drink water out of. So. <laughs> Very good. Anyways. All right, tell us about this piece here to start with. This piece here, actually, uh, it's probably one of my favorite, if not my most favorite, I've made so far. Um, I call it Plumas de la Suerte, which in Spanish means lucky feathers. And uh, actually, the two feathers to me is what I call my lucky feathers. And um, the reason this actually has such a cool story is because my friend, uh, he's a leather maker, and he's traveled a lot rodeoing with me and stuff. And uh, he made me a wallet with these two feathers and said, here you go, man, this is, you know, your deal. I'm making this your thing. It's kind of what I'd call for you your lucky symbol. So since then, it's just kind of been a thing for me. And I uh, actually have a tattoo that has those two feathers. So it's just kind of something I've carried deep with me because my best friend kind of, you know, made that a starting thing for me because he rode it a lot with me and stuff. So it was a really cool memory I have, something I can tell for a long time. Okay. Tell us the medium that you used here. What is, what is this? It's uh, ceramics. Ceramics. So. Okay. Now, tell us about these pieces. Um, the Cocapelli, uh, being from New Mexico, I've always kind of been inspired by the Southwest culture, Southwest style of art, and uh, that kind of stuff. Um, 
the Coke Pelly thing, the reason I wanted to do it differently, as you can tell they're facing different ways, is because uh, it kind of gives it to me just a different flow about it. They're not all doing the same thing. Um, the reason I've done the Coca Pelly, I've uh, done other projects with Coca Pelly cutouts. I did a really big one that had the same one uh, cut out all around it. Um, I just like it. It just kind of it's something that's been part of my, I guess, heritage or upbringing that I've always really liked and seen a lot, especially going back to New Mexico. So it kind of reminds me of my double home, being of New Mexico and Oklahoma. So. All right. So what are the, how, how did you construct these pieces? <clears throat> these actually, what you do is your clay starts out uh, wet and water is how we uh, work with it up there at college. Mm -hmm. uh, you put dry clay in with it get it the right consistency, then you uh, put it in a pug meal, which expels all the air out of it. Because if you have air bubbles in it, it'll blow up, blow out, you could have anything well, go wrong with it. Uh, well, usually what happens is like, say there was an air bubble right there and it popped, it might blow a hole completely in the piece. Just because that, when it's firing it, just the way the clay works, it fires and it expands inside there. And it's just kind of like an explosion that goes on. <clears throat> so anyways, uh, after you get your clay out, you uh, put it on an extruder um, or no, not an extruder, clay, uh, excuse me, clay roller. Okay. And you roll out slabs and you put your, um, your slabs there. And I actually have these, this template and this template cut out differently because I make these canisters quite a bit. So um, I cut out all the sides I need for it and then the squares on top. And they do what you call the cross uh, hatching method and the scoring method. And you scratch your clay because I cut mine in angles. Some people just kind of flat, but I like that nice sharp, you know, corner and you uh, put slip, which is just like a clay and water material, and it kind of helps glue your clay together. And when your clay gets glued together, then you just construct it all the way around. This is just a separate piece of clay. Same way I did this, just out of a slab, flat slab piece, okay. cut it out, same with the lid. And then this, they have what you call a clay extruder, and um, you just put like a log of clay in a tube, and it has a handle and you pull it down and it just rolls your clay out into certain lengths and you cut it and you just use the same type of attachment method as this. And that's how I did the handles and the okay. part around the lid. So. Okay, now what about the colors? Um, the colors, this is actually what they call tamaki, which is the base brown color you see here with nuka drizzle. Um, this was a, I've actually done one other piece. Uh, it was the other Coca Pelli piece I was telling you guys about that I did. Mm -hmm. um, I glazed it with the same exact, but in a different kiln, and it came out differently. So it was kind of neat to see the variations of what an electric and a gas kiln could do, you know. How, as far how as are glaze. they different? How do they mess the glaze differently? Just I temperatures, they're just, they use a different firing method. Um, so the temperatures just vary with the glaze. And Does it actually, change them different colors? Yes, ma'am. What we do here is actually uh, what they call um, cone 10. Uh, stoneware clay mm -hmm. with cone tin glaze and um, that was why the variation had its differences because of the oxidation and stuff like that. So it's, can you reproduce this? Yes ma'am I can. Like completely? Yep. Yep I can. I can do different sizes anything as well. As long as you have the right kiln? Yes ma'am. <laughs> so I kind of like the way this color turned out a lot better. It has the blue you know kind of crystals you see in it. It's a lot more fun I think. Okay. So. Very good. All right. Um, if any of our viewers if they're not he well They'll be watching this after the auction is over anyways. But if any of our viewers are interested in purchasing anything from you or having you go ahead and make something for them, how do they get in touch with you? Um, I have a business card and my cell phone number. I don't know if I'm allowed to give that out on here. Um, it's up to you if you want to give everybody in 19 if, communities your if, cell phone number. If you would like to get any of my uh, artwork, I do a lot of things. So custom orders, anything you would like. Um, if I have something similar that you would just like something changed, like say a different pattern or a brand for, for say, I could do that as well. Okay. Um, I have a business card. I am on Facebook. My number is 580-651-3790. Um, and that's the best, the best way to reach me. Okay, very good. Thank All you. right, thank you. Good luck in the auction thank tonight. Thank you, guys. It was nice meeting you. You too. Thank you. Now, Sage Kinsey. Um, Sage, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Um, what you made? Well, usually we know what the major is, but. <laughs> okay, um, I'm Sage Kinsey. I was born and raised in Daresat, Texas, up in the Panhandle, a little bitty town. Um, both of my parents graduated from OPSU, so I chose OPSU as well. Um, it's just a small, close home. I love the feel of it. and. I loved art in high school. I didn't get very many chances at art class.
classes in high school, so when I came to college, I was like, yes, all right, this is for me. Like, I'm going to jump in with both feet. So okay. that's why I chose art as a major. What, what are you? What's your class? Um, I'm a senior this year, but I will not be graduating. I've got another year left in me, thanks to a minor in education that I'm finishing up. No, that's fine. And your major is art? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, you've got four pieces here. One, so. Two, three. Four, yes. Let us start with this one okay. because you have dif they're they're different mediums. Yes, I've got a pastel, an acrylic, another acrylic, and actually a ballpoint pen, just your regular old ballpoint pen. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> this stuff, you know what? We don't ever use this stuff in the office, so it's like, oh wow, this is pretty cool. Yeah. I could do that if I picked it up. You show us a pen, I'm like, dang it. There's no I could way try that. I can do. <laughs> There's no way. No way. All right, so tell us about this piece first. Okay, this is my first piece. It's a 53 Chevy Bel Air, and I photographed my reference for this uh, picture at the Hooker Car Show. So a local. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, does, I, the, does the owner of this vehicle know about this no, piece? No, I, I didn't even get a chance to meet him, so I don't know. Maybe he'll show up here tonight. Maybe he'll see, see it, it on TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I love red. It's one of my favorite colors, and this one just kind of stuck out to me, and I decided to reproduce it as a pastel, and I'm pretty happy with the result. It's very nice. Thank very you. lovely. Okay, tell us about this piece. Um, this is an acrylic. Uh, it's called the Three Amigos. <laughs> These three guys kind of posed exactly like this for me out on a friend's farm uh, near Cleo Springs, Oklahoma. And I just captured it and I know lots of people love cattle around this area. I come from a cattle family so I figured it'd be a good seller here. Very good. All right. Tell us about this piece right here behind you. Okay. The a buffalo. buffalo. This guy, he was actually at the Cherokee Trading Post and I took a picture of him. And I love bright colors. You can't tell it based how I'm dressed tonight, but <laughs> I do, honestly. And um, it's acrylic as well. I love acrylic. It's kind of what I started out with, and I'm just comfortable with it. So you get lots of good uh, patterns and textures with it. So. so why is it that you like acrylic so much? What is it about acrylic? I think it's just the familiarity with it. I did some of it it's in high fluid. school, and it's, it's just easy for me to get blends and like how I want it. So it's just easy to manipulate for me. All right, so you said you like bright colors. Why'd you choose the colors that you chose? You know, plain old boring buffalo colors, the browns, you see those all the time. I wanted to um, spice up a little bit and add some of my favorite colors in there, so. It's very nice. So how did you. you how did you get the, it looks like drips. Yes, um, that's just a thinning of paint and I kind of um, put it on there kind of like liquidy at the top and turn my canvas vertical and let it run by itself. So that's how you kind of get that effect. And then the rest is just paintbrush, layers. And so whenever you're doing these different techniques, are these things that you learn in in school, like whether it's high school or in college in, in the art classes, or is this just something you're like, hey, I think I'm gonna try blah, blah. we're gonna get out a blowtorch or some paint well, thinner. you kind of, like in Brian's classes and Yvonne's, um, you kind of, they give you methods that you can use in your pieces, but you take with them and run with them however you want. So it's just kind of an experimenting thing, like you say, hey, this works for me, I'm gonna use it in this piece. Or like, no, I don't think this will work for that piece. So it's just kind of a, a personal, so you say your person is personal preference. You yeah. know, you get to do what you want. People who aren't artists like myself, I'm uh -huh. like, tell me what to do, what paint do I put on what brush and where do I smear it? Yeah. That's what we think. So whenever there's something different, something completely new, it's like, where did this come from? How? Why? What? And it's I don't know, honestly. It's just, cool. it's just like it's a God given talent I have and I can just see an image and reproduce it. Like I it's it's crazy. I don't it's even just talent. Yeah, I can't explain it. It's just yeah. talent. The rest of us we're just gonna have to buy no, your I'm stuff. Sorry, That's it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, tell us about this last one. Okay, this one I actually had the <laughs> same truck in last year's Paw Barrel. It was a brightly colored um, acrylic kinda like this one. Uh -huh. But this is a different angle. Um, this is actually at my great grandfather's auction and I took this picture and I thought you know what I want to try something different like ballpoint pen something very simple and everyday thing you see laying around and so I picked it up and went with it and found out I really like using ballpoint pen again <laughs> for those of us who aren't artists it's just 
How do you deal with the globs? How do you pick which pin you want? Because you can't just say ballpoint pin because they're yeah. all so Honestly, different. Honestly, I went to Walmart and I just got a box of those Bic pins, like a 24 pack, just in case like I ran out of ink. And I just kept changing out every so often. And you know, you get the darker areas from more pressure and then the lighter areas, you really kind of have to back off like really lightly to leave them like I did kind of here, just a few strokes. But um, this is my first actually completed piece in ballpoint pen. It's and very nice. Thank you. It is very nice. I'll definitely be using this more so. I mean, it's a lot of strokes and your hand kind of gets tired after a while, but. Right, so the paper. I mean, this isn't just regular print paper. I mean, what kind of, it's, do you have to have special paper it's even? It's just a drawing paper. We, um, all art students, we have these drawing uh, pads that are like 18 by 24. And they're a little thicker than your regular copy paper, a little sturdier. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I use for this one. And you gotta be careful with this, especially like the smudges, you know, I had to be really careful because you know how a pen can smudge. That was kind of one of the other thoughts. Hands. Yeah. Mine would look like a four-year-old <laughs> did it, but. <laughs> I tried to keep it really nice and clean, so. So do you have to treat it after you're done with it or do you just put it in the, put it in the frame? I just put it in the frame, that way it's sealed and protected and ready to go, so. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Um, which medium is it that you prefer? Oh man, that's a tough one. Well, like I said, acrylic's kind of my familiar um, medium, but I figured out that I really like pastel too. You can get bright colors and easy blendings with it too. And that's something I really didn't have in high school. And so I picked it up when I came here to college right. and I fell in love with it. So it's kind of a toss up between acrylic and pastel, honestly. Well, they're both very bright. Whenever you're creating a piece, like you said, you took a picture of this one, you took a picture of this one, you took a picture of that one, that one you had from your grandpa's auction, or I think that's what you said. Yes. Whenever you're putting these on paper, I mean, do you have to be, do you have to be really good at drawing, or do you go ahead and make up for your deficiencies with the color? Um, <laughs> well, you do have to be pretty technical because, you know, like with this one, angles, lines, everything, you have to make sure you get those right, especially on a vehicle. Right. But um, you can cover up some, you know, mistakes and stuff with the colors and, you know, make it. So I just need to stick with abstract? <laughs> That, that might be good. Actually, I'm not very good at abstract. I can't. Like, I have to see something in it, you know, realistic, because obviously I'm pretty realistic minded, you know. So, abstract's kind of difficult for me to get. Well, I might just be an artist after all. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see on this okay. whole thing, but probably okay. not. All right. Um, for our viewers, yes. Um, if they are interested in getting in touch with you um, and having you maybe create a piece for them, or if they would just like to see any of your pieces, how would they go about getting in touch um, with you? They can go like they can email me, text me. I've got business cards. I'm always up there at OPSU at the art department. Okay. So, so give around. us an email address. Um, do you have an email address yes, that you'd I do. like to give out? Okay. Yeah. What is that one? Sage S A G E dot Kinsey K I N S E Y at gmail dot com. Okay. And, you, and I answer that regularly, so you can get in touch with me by that. All right. Very good. All right. Good luck in the auction Thank tonight. Thank you so much. You're I appreciate welcome. it. Clay Jackson. Clay, you went to school at Panhandle. When did you go to school over there? I went uh, from 97 to 2002. Okay, and a long time. what was your major? <laughs> almost a career out of that. Yeah, almost. I sure enjoyed it there. Um, majored in animal science and art, fine art. All right, so why did you choose Oklahoma Panhandle State University? Oh, I just liked it. It was a small school and um, agricultural community. Um, I just really felt kind of at home there. Where are you from originally? Northeast New Mexico, Springer, New Mexico. Okay, and did you have other other friends that had come to Panhandle with no, you? No, I was the first one that I knew that came here. Um, I just came and looked at the school and really liked it. And, and then I had a couple of brothers that followed me here. But. All right, what, are, um, what were some of the things that you did while you were in school? Like, we'll just focus on art, art. just on the art, just on the art, um, the different mediums, the different mostly, activities. Mostly pencil, 
um, graphite pencil work, and then I got into some painting, some watercolor. Um, I was very active in the art club, of course, and I helped start this whole deal. Uh, I was By the way, thank you. The founding <laughs> it's doing really well. Too. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a fun event to come to every year. All right, where are you at now? Right now, I live in Kim, Colorado. I work in a saddle shop up there. I've been there for a little over a year, uh, so I'm doing a little bit of artwork again, finally. I worked for a ranch in New Mexico for eight years and just really didn't have time to do, do much. So what I does did. that feel like as an artist? Oh, it's great. Um, it, it's nice to be around some more artistic people again. The ranch life, I loved it. It was great. Uh, I may go back someday, but, but I kind of needed a change for a little while. Um, that was one of the largest ranches in New Mexico, and we were we stayed pretty short-handed, so you just you, you didn't get a lot of free time. So now, so I as have, an artist, how was that? I mean, because I know you've got those creative thoughts. You see something whenever you're out on the ranch, and you're like, oh, well, it's, I got to do that. Well, it's fantastic for for material. You're you're covered up with material all the time. You just have to pack a camera with you all the time, <laughs> which is not always possible. So, I mean. I, I got a lot of material to work from later, uh, but I just didn't have the time to get any work done. Um, so now I, I still stay pretty busy, but I'm, I'm working in the leather shop every day and, and kind of more creative process that way every day. So. All right, so the leather shop, that's not something you did at Panhandle, is it? No, and I started that after anything. after I left, and I really started that because, uh, like a lot of working cowboys, you can't a lot of guys can't afford to buy some of this nice stuff. So you just figure out how to make it yourself, and then you take it to the next level and, and get more creative and more uh, artistic in it. Um, and the sky's the limit. You can you can build stuff for the poorest working cowboys, and you can build stuff for multimillionaires that'll sit in their house. You, know? you got to find that happy balance in there somewhere. But it's the same process, though. I mean, I mean, you're not really changing anything up, whether you're selling it to the millionaire or no, to the working cowboy. It's gonna be the, the same process. The, uh, the rule of thumb is function first, beauty second. So everything I build is functionable. Uh, first and foremost, and then you, you get fancier on top of that. So. All right, well, since you're, we're talking about leather, you have a couple of pieces here that that display some of your leather work. Tell us about the saddle, first of all. The saddle, um, this is actually my second saddle I've ever built. Uh, I built it for a friend of mine. He, he was kind enough to place an order with me, and it took him a long time to get it, but I'm pretty proud of it. Are there okay? So just just in the detail work, tell us how you go about getting that detail because I mean you've got you've got what is there like a like a frame or something underneath it or a base or it's wood. what do you have? It's a wood tree. Okay. And then you just start covering it with leather. Okay. <clears throat> all the carving is done with swivel knife and bevelers and all kinds of little little stamps. It's a long process. I can't even count the hours I have in the work uh, to do all the tooling. So is there any is there anything in this that's in the tooling that is says Clay Jackson? Is well, there that you, one thing in there? No, I mean you you kind of develop your own style when you start doing enough of it. It's like painting, it's it's like drawing, it's like everything else. You can see different artwork and see whose it is. Uh, you can kind of tell from a distance. I can look at other leather work and see, kind of recognize who who built some of it. Just just in the details of their tooling and their style and their you know their flow and everything else and so it's it's all just kind of see i love talking to the artist because i have no idea what you're saying <laughs> well, it's, <laughs> it's like how would you know that how would how would i be able to distinguish yours from bob's saddle well, i mean it's just cool that it, you can it's do like that. everything else if you study it enough you, you can distinguish it know somebody else's order. That's just crazy. All right, what do you got here? Got a couple pairs of spur straps. These are little, these are some of my little affordable deals that, well, everything's affordable. <laughs> <laughs> but these are, you know, there's not a whole lot into them. You can whip those out pretty quick so you can keep your prices low. Everybody can, can get a pair of those. All right, so then while we're still talking about leather work, tell us about this piece. 
Okay, this is something special that I've uh, <coughs> These are woolies, woolly leggings, woolly chaps. Okay. They used to wear them in the turn of the century all the way up to now oh, they were pretty popular through the 20s and 30s. In the cold weather, they would keep guys warm. So okay. if you're riding out in the blizzard, uh, the hair would really shed the, the water better and they'd keep the heat in. And so these guys that didn't have pickups and trailers back then rode horseback everywhere. They needed something to kind of protect them from the elements. So they would wear these. And these are not traditional. The traditional ones are, are canvas lined, which really also kept uh, helped shed the water. And these are leather. And these are just right? leather. Leather all the way through. But this is a new style, a contemporary style, that I, I've just started making these uh, here this, this last year. So is this more of a, I hate to sound girly, but is this more of a fashion it's, it's kind a, of a fashionable, it I, I mean, be, it's, yeah. it's cool looking. Cowboys are fashionable people. They are, I there's know a, they are. There's a, lot, there's a lot of that in it. I mean, every, like I say, function first, right. style second. But yeah, there's, there's a, you can look back at pictures uh, all the way back to the 1800s, and there was, there was guys that really adorned their work with fancy tooling or silver or stuff like that. So why Woolies? I mean what was it that made this why what was it that struck you to make I just this? love the old style stuff. Um, those old cowboys knew what they were doing. It worked for years and years and years. And it, it's all trends. Everything comes and goes. I'm bringing them back because they're <laughs> they're fun. They're cool. Cuz I'm a bad guy. That's so right. That's right. <laughs> All so right. I started building these. I built a couple of traditional pair, and then I, I built a couple on this pattern. And they've really kind of taken off, and it just Good. comes back around, and people have gotten really interested in them again. Whether it's nostalgia or, or what, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. They're just kind of neat. All right, what about your materials? Where do you get your materials? Because I don't, I don't know if I could just go to Walmart. Oh, yeah. No, not at Walmart, but you, there's a tanneries and... Um, a lot of different leather stores we, we buy leather from. Uh, but I mean, like for your other materials, like the silver or oh, you know the the wool. I mean, is this just that you're out and, and well, you, you can you get find this at furniture stores or leather stores or I mean, okay. different different places. The different silver and stuff like that. There's there's artists that make it, and we try like this is nothing fancy, but there are great silversmiths out there doing a lot of work these days and they're artists too and so you try to support them that was my next question so do you try to support those oh, yeah. artists by purchasing their items to incorporate into your artwork as yeah. well so you both kind of get something out of it yeah we do i mean like i've got a, a boat buckle here made by a good friend of mine it's he's a, a very good silversmith in amarillo and so I, i'll call him up and i'll get order something from him and, and it's like everything else you got to put an order in and get to it when they can and it's all everybody everybody I know that is a some sort of a gear maker is behind the schedule <laughs> which is a good problem to have that is good at least people want your stuff that is really good it's all humbling right. but. you have you have several other pieces in here um, tell us well just uh, start pick start pointing them out because I mean they're different mediums you said you really like drawing yeah is that one these, these are some older prints that I've had. Uh, working for that for that ranch, I, I really had to take a, several years off, and I, I didn't produce anything for about six years. Uh -huh. So this last year, I really focused on trying to get back into it and, and start producing again. And so these watercolors up here, these are some of, my, some of my newer stuff. Yeah. Wow. And so it's been a long, frustrating process getting back into it after six year break, trying to relearn. And I mean, you just really have to stay on top of your craft or else it just kind of goes away. But, but if so, you really, can, do, do, does it fade significantly? I mean, you're. Well, for me, it did. I mean, I, I've had to really struggle to get back to it. And I, I forgot how much I enjoyed it, but it's still hard to find time to do it all. You go to work and you work for eight, ten hours a day and then you come home and it's like starting another job. You have to really get in the mindset and, and focus on 
what you want to do, and it, sometimes you're just not feeling it, and sometimes you just have to push through it. So but they told me I was going to be the featured artist, so I really tried to get some work done. I didn't get near as much done as I wanted to, but I had some older stuff. But all right, so how long did you have when it, from the time that they said, "All right, you're the featured artist"? How long did you have to go ahead and get your creative juices flowing and start trying well, to get some stuff pulled together? Embarrassingly, I, I had a year. But uh, if I would have brought everything I threw away, I'd have been all right. <laughs> but I, 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 I feel like I need to produce the best work I can. So I don't want to just bring a bunch of junk. Right. So, and, and you, you kind of owe that to your customers, too. Right. So, if it's not up to my standards, I don't want to push it off on somebody else, you know. So, you try to really, I'm not saying this is my best work, but it's something that I felt comfortable enough to, to no, bring. I think, and I, I, really I think it's amazing, though. I think though. they turned out all right. Yeah, I think it's amazing. So you try to be a little bit humble. <laughs> again, to the untrained eye, I can't, I can't stress that enough. I, I enjoy talking to the artist so much because it's so foreign to me. Yeah. I cannot. I have a keyboard. I have a remote control. Well, I understand that. It's so. a. It's hard. It's everybody is judging you for for your work and everything I do. I feel like I'm being judged on on what I produce, and and that's good because it pushes you. But it's also nerve wracking like, sometimes. I was like, some pressure with that, though. Sometimes it, it's a little tough, but but it's fun too. It, so, well, you've done this. You've you've been involved for several years, especially even with this. What kind of advice can you give to some of the younger artists? Because, like you said, there's a lot of pressure involved with this. What well, kind of advice can you give them as far as how to deal with the pressure? You know, whenever they're creating a piece, if they don't feel if it is the best that they can do or if it's not the best in their opinion. Well, there's there's artists that I know that won't ever show anything because they never feel like it's good enough, it, even though it, it probably is. I mean, there's a lot of people that, that enjoy the work. You have to find the happy medium. You have to You have to enjoy what you're doing and say, this is a piece of me and I hope you like it as much as I do. And, and most of the time people are very supportive of that. Um, all I say is just put your best out there. You just gotta strive to do your best. I mean, there's a lot of people that are can be lazy and, and not wanna put the work in, but, but you really need to push yourself. Right. And that's hard sometimes, but it's, it's something I feel like uh, I don't want to just bring something just because I have it. I don't, you know, if it's if I don't feel like I can stand up next to it and talk about it and be proud of it, then I don't want to bring it. But you also have to have to say that, you know, sometimes you got to let other people. You got to kind of feel that. Yeah, you got to let them in. You got to kind of feel feel what the what people say. You know. It's, it's, it's just enjoyable to me. So would you prefer showing your your work to someone like me, the untrained eye, or would you rather have somebody that's very critical, somebody that is kind of a peer, you know, a peer artist, or maybe even somebody who's a little, a little above more elevated? That um, you need that criticism from, from people that are a uh, higher skill set than you are because it makes you better. Right. But you also need people that are untrained uh, because you can, like this, sit here and explain it, and it really, it really lets them know what you're about and, and what you're, what you're doing and what you're trying to portray. So, I mean, I, I like it all. I, I love telling people about my work and telling people why I do my work the way I do. Um, because there's a lot of people that say, "Well, I don't understand that. I don't like it." Well, if you don't know what it's about, you may not like it. Right. So, I mean, any of this artwork that's here, if if you don't understand it, doesn't mean you should dislike it. It means you should go talk to the artists and see what they're about. Yeah, I agree. I agree very much so. All right, any parting words, any wisdom for the younger generations that are going to be coming into this later on? No, no wisdom here. Work hard and, and do your best. <laughs> Yeah, contact information. Play Jackson. Look me up on Facebook. That's all I know. 
I don't have cards. I don't have a website. I don't have any email. I live out in the middle of nowhere. That's a little difficult to promote yourself, isn't it? It is, but it's fine. I, we're, All right. Well, we're where's the where's the where's the shop? The leather shop that you work at. Where, what's the name in, of this place? Uh, uh, Mosman Salary, Kim, Colorado. Seventy miles from anywhere. It's we're out in the middle of nowhere. Seriously. So. Probably a good thing. We do a lot of work, a lot of business on Facebook, and that's where we show a lot of stuff. Okay, so. very good. So if anybody would like to get in touch with you, then they can go to that website. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we have with us now Yvonne Sangster. Yvonne. Um, First of all, you're an instructor over at OPSU. Would you like to tell our viewers what you do? I, I'm an instructor of art there, and I teach pastel, which is my passion. And I teach drawing and figure drawing, fundamentals of art, and design. And okay. I love it. So. <laughs> I've got the well, best of and you're really pretty good at it. Yes. So uh. <laughs> I love you know when you get to go to work every day doing what you love. I get to create art and I get to teach students and I love that. That's that's so, wonderful. You really yes, can't beat that. I, I love to I love to pass down what I have learned. There are many artists that they 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 ha, they like to keep secrets what they do. They want to keep it a secret. But my mentor, Ben Connors, was a fabulous instructor, also as an artist, and he loved to pass on what he knew, and that's what I like to do also. Why would they keep it top secret? They, why, they, why be stingy? They just, because they have captured something, and they uh, and they just want to hang on to it. They don't it. want anybody yeah. else to figure out the secret and exactly. sell their art. <laughs> and not all are like that, but there have been a few. I've met a few that way, so. All right, tell us. Um, you guys are doing something different this year. Yes. This is the first year I don't actually have an actual painting here. The instructors at the college, um, we're auctioning off our sales a blank canvas tonight. Uh, knowing that the people that come here know our work, what kind of work we do, and we're counting on trusting us to uh, bid on a painting that will be done in a certain amount of time and, and uh, it'll be a surprise to them. Maybe they want to give a little hint to what they want, you know, to me anyway. Uh, and we will create them, a, 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 I will create them a pastel, or I will do a colored pencil or drawing, whatever. I'm mostly known for my pastel. That's what people usually want when they want something from me. But I do do other mediums. I'm loving colored pencil right now also. <laughs> so so we're tonight we're auctioning off a blank canvas. All right, so why? What What is behind the blank canvas? Because most people, again, not an artist, so I'm thinking, oh, I like pretty picture. I want pretty picture on my wall. Yes. So why why a blank canvas? Uh, so just the, the, the mystery of it and something new. Like I say, everyone that comes every year, they know us. They know what kind of work we do. Right. And they are going to bid on us trusting. They know they're going to get a fabulous piece of work knowing the kind of work that we do. They're familiar with us. We've got followers. So is it just going to be a big surprise at the end or are they going to say, all right, this is what I want. Here's a picture of my grandbaby. Okay. <laughs> it, actually, I think it's going to depend upon the artist. Um, for myself, okay. I am very open to some suggestions of what they would like. Really? So, so, so it's not, you You can't say, oh, I do wildlife, please don't make me draw your babies, please don't make, you no, can do it. For anything. me, it's not, because I like to do it all. You do it all? <laughs> yes, I love wildlife. I've won several, best of, uh, show in first place in wildlife several times. <laughs> And, and I love doing portraits. I'm known for doing portrait people. Uh, like the way I do children. So, and I've been still life. I just horses and you know whatever. So, wow. I, I like it all. That's and just amazing. Just, they see the book we're auctioning off tonight. They can see the painting I did last year, which was a, 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 you know mountains and a horse rider and, and everything in it. So, and in the past I've had uh, portraits of Native Americans. I've done, I've had done horses, and so they know what I do, so. Well, tell us, aside from this being different, you mentioned the book. Yes. Tell us about that. We have a book that's for this year, we're going to auction off, it's leather bound. It has, a, of the instructors, it has our last year's 
auction piece in it. Okay. And it has all of the alumni and their pieces that are in the auction this year, pictures of it, and all of the students. And they're all autographed. We've autographed every page. So oh, wow. it's a special. And then we're going to take orders if people want to order one. But that will be auctioned off tonight, an autographed book. So. Very it has nice. pictures of us too in it. So. Now, have people asked for this in the past? Because that is, I mean, that's kind of a thing like if, if you go to an auction at Christie's or what, I mean, they have the they have the books yes. with the pieces. Is this something that we can look forward to? We can. And in the future as well? Over, like I say, I think we're going to get it where they can order a book if, if, if they want that's like that, you know. Okay. So. Very good. All right. We're going to go backwards just a little bit just and have you tell us a little bit about the history of the Paul Farrell Memorial Art Auction, because this is the 16th year that you guys have been doing that. Yes. Uh, Paul Farrell used to come to the college. He had, had uh, and, and they talked him into coming back to school, you know, just to get back and to get an art and everything. And he, uh, I think, kind of worried about it because he was older, but we have uh, older student people all the time. And he came in, and he was just one of us. We just loved him. And he painted, we were inspired by what he painted, and he was just a, he was just a gem, just a gem of pleasure to know. And I can remember going away for the summer and coming back and I found out he had passed away and I was just so sad. I wished I had heard about it in time. And, and I was just so sad that he wasn't back, but he was just a part of the, a, a part of the kids and just, you know, we loved being with him and he loved being with us. And so we just, when we started this auction, uh, we wanted to name it uh, Paul Farrell after him. We did, and we couldn't think of any better, any better person to begin this and, and keep his memory alive. Very nice. <laughs> now the proceeds from the auction. The proceeds go. We have a scholarship fund at the college, and a, a lot it goes to endangered students. We have the students that they're in trouble and they're going to maybe drop out of school because of funds and they you know they just can't and we help them out and so half and that's of, specific to the art department yes though, correct? it is just the art department and so half of the what of the auction tonight half of the money goes to the artists themselves so they can okay. kind of revamp their supplies or whatever <laughs> and then the other half goes to the scholarship okay very good all right well Good luck this evening with this, and I guess we'll probably have to ask you next year how well this goes I, over. I, it's going to be a, a, I'm curious to know if people are afraid to bid, bid on a blank canvas or if they trust and know what we do. You never know till you try. I know, it's, it's kind of scary a little <laughs> bit, but, but I know there's people out there that, that follow me and, and love my work, and I have no doubt that they'll, they, I, I really feel like the bidding will go pretty well, I do. Okay, very good. Well, so, good luck. Thank good you luck. very much. Thank you. All right, we have with us Hector Cobos. Hector has been on this show, I don't know how many times, Couple. five times maybe. Maybe, maybe, for different events. Right. Different events. Um, you were here last year and you had a couple of pieces. Yes. Um, why don't you first of all tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, like because you are a graduate of OPSU. Right. I'm a, well. I'm a Gaming graduate, and then I went to OPSU, spent a couple of years there, graduated with a BFA, uh, moved on to the city, and I live in the Paseo Arts District. Okay. Very good. Um, tell us about the piece that you have here today. Uh, the piece that I have is a platter that's been fired up to a thousand plus degrees. Uh, open it up, open the kiln, and then the hair has been applied to the clay. The clay burns, and the smoke that generates uh, goes into the clay, penetrates it, and maintains there. Uh, and it's got to be a very specific temperature. If it's too hot, it burns out, singes out. Uh, and then if it's too cold, the hair burns, but it doesn't. The smoke doesn't go into the clay. So. All right. So how do you how do you learn these techniques? How do you know it has to be exactly one thousand degrees uh, and this a lot, a lot certain of hair? Blown up pieces and broken pots and trial and error. Um, started out by the instructor David Elder challenged me to make something that a technique that we didn't do at the at the uh, university. So um, I of course looked at the fastest way that I could figure it out and uh, we already did raku. So this was one of the next things up. Uh, gratif you know, instant gratification. Really? If it makes it. All right, so so this piece, as a platter, 
<clears throat> right. It, it's a well. It's a wall wall hanging. Um, the since the clay, I'm like, yeah. right. The clay's still <laughs> porous, so you, no, you can't put stuff on it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, bacteria. But um, no, it's just so a wall hanging. So is it sealed or is it still? Is it still? Uh, I put a uh, clear on it that seals the smoke in there. The uh, also sugar. Apply sugar on there, and uh, as it hits the thousand plus degree clay, caramelizes and leaves that spot. As if you would see a burnt pot almost. So, all right. So, at the Paseo Art District, is this the kind of thing that you do a lot? Yeah. Or is this yeah, just it's, kind of. It's a personal thing. Um, we're a teaching studio, so we have over 50 people coming in throughout the week. A group of 10 individuals that have been there 20 plus years. So. Uh, this, I do this on my own, uh, I do it in the back, and it typically stinks out the building. Uh, <laughs> it, I, I say it smells like home. <laughs> my dad grew up, uh, I grew up around cattle, so no biggie. I uh, went to this yeah, university, hung out with the rodeo people, so no biggie for me. But, so now we're getting an idea of what it smells like whenever you're right, doing Right, right, right. <laughs> Not quite like the other day here where it, you could see the thick air, but... It does smell. That, that's that's why I like doing the sugar. It caramelizes and instantly you get this uh, baking aroma. The, the the sugar sort of neutralizes the the rest of the smoke. Okay, very good. Tell all us. The, yeah, all the doors open, fans <laughs> going. Why is it that you come back to this event every year? Um, I, I love it. I mean, I fell in I fell in love with clay. I fell in love with the demonstrations, with uh, seeing artwork being made, and then um, I was recruited to come to one of these events in 2002. That was my first time and um, fell in love with it. I was trying to bid and uh, I was beyond my budget. So <laughs> That's a good thing though. Right, I mean. it's, it, it feels great to come back, to give back, to, to be a part of. Uh, I was here last night and this morning um, helping out, getting set up, so it's, it's, it's a nice thing. Very good. Um, Art Jubilee. Are you going uh, to be participating in that again this year? Or I was a featured artist last year, right. um, both here and at the Jubilee. So uh, I think they're giving breaks. There are people in rotation. Uh, I believe it's David Elder that's doing it this okay. year. He has retired, but he's making a comeback. <laughs> so um, besides that, I'm preparing on the quest of making 5,000 pots for the Downtown Arts Festival. Okay, that was going to be my next question. So, Tell us what you're doing in the city. Uh, in the city, we're getting ready. Um, like I said, we have over 50 students coming in throughout the week. Uh, besides that, any downtime, um, I'm loading and loading kilns, thousands of pots everywhere, um, making them, firing them, stacking them, boxing them, labeling them. And then here in a couple of weeks, we're going to be unloading them, lacing <laughs> them, packing them, and then hauling them downtown to the right in front of the Civic Center, a new location or they've gone back to their original location. So. Okay, and what event is that? Uh, fe downtown Festival of the Arts, or down Festival of the Arts downtown. Okay, and that's when? It is nine April 19th through the 20, uh, 24th. It's a week long, <laughs> yeah. But you'll be there. Right, okay. on the spot. Okay, Firing. very good. <laughs> Sweating. Stinking <laughs> things up. Embracing it, embracing the Oklahoma wind. Okay, got it. All right, well, good luck on the auction this Thank evening. Yeah. Definitely appreciate you coming out yet again. <laughs>
are um, or what are your what are your hopes what are maybe your future? the future but i'm i'm gonna try to pursue as a famous artist first and then go from there very good well here's your debut <laughs> All right, tell us about the pieces that you have. Um, this is a tree of tea, and it's a functional piece. It's all coils, except for this part is pinch pot. Um, You're going to have to explain. Explain, like, the different techniques, because not everybody understands pinch pot or coils. Okay, um, coils, It's a you put it into a machine, and it comes out as little Kind of like of a Play-Doh, like the little yes, Play-Doh squirt exactly. things? Yes, Okay. And then um, you... Sorry, I have kids. I understand Play-Doh. <laughs> You score them and you put them together. Okay. You put magic water in between them so they hold. And then um, pinch pot, you take a piece of clay and you just pinch it until it's into the shape you want. Again, like Play-Doh? Yes. What? I might be an artist after all. <laughs> all right. Um, go ahead and tell us a little more. This um, piece. Why, why tree of tea? Our assignment for this piece was we just had to make, make a teapot and I love nature and I thought of maybe doing a tree and then the flowers around it and it actually did have a platter with it but it didn't come out so <laughs> it's just that's it's just, part of what you selected yes. though with this medium sometimes they don't work out yes. so well that's the joy and the curse of being a ceramic well, see, you say this is functional. In my world, um, if I have a teapot, it's made of like something that you can that you can drop repeatedly, and it will dent and it will ding. Um, for this, is the I mean, it is functional, but it's going to be a little bit do? more. How delicate. do you use this? I mean, is it just? <laughs> I don't understand how to this use this. This can actually this. be uh, warmed up. Um, it won't. It can take heat. Then, um, can you put it on a can you put it on an open flame or how do you? Do, I, how would you? Would I have you, actually you never tried to use it in an open, open flame. I'm not sure if that would work. Probably not so much. Maybe boil it on the stove, pour yeah, it in there. Yeah, and pour it in there. Um, okay. But they tell you don't let it get cold. Like don't have it cold and then to pour hot in it because it will more likely to explode. But just a possibility. Okay. Okay. Um, now the glazes that you selected. Uh huh. Why? Why? Why the colors? Um, I did the tamaku on this one because it's very tree-like and it has that. It turns out the brown and the black together, and it just looks more like a tree. Uh -huh. And uh, to give it that effect, and then I wanted to do something different instead of all the same color. I let I like to play with colors a lot, so I decided to go with like a. I can't really remember the glaze, but. Um, one glaze on the bottom and then a blue green on the top. Just so, to, so just so Sean can see this, the inside, how do you get the different colors in there? You actually just dip it in. And um, this is just one glaze and it just does it by itself. It's reactive. It's just the, magic? <laughs> it's reactive to the chemicals in the glaze, in the fire, in the kiln. Okay. Okay. Now tell us about this piece. Um, this one is Love Triangle. Um, it is made out of slabs and uh, it has a little rose piece in the middle and then um, one of my fellow students helped me design this uh, stand for it. So um, it can be used for decoration or jewelry, anything you want. So it's just a piece to have fun with. Alright, so why, why ceramics? What is it about ceramics that you love? I just get lost in it when I start doing it, to be honest. And like, I didn't even make sketches for these. They just, I just started building, and it turned out to be. That makes no sense to me. <laughs> Especially this piece. I was actually just messing with extra clay I had, and I was just forming them together. And I was like, oh, I've never done triangles. So I kept stacking more and more triangles together, and. It looked good, but I knew it was missing something, and I saw another girl in my class, she had done some flowers on hers, so I wanted to try to do a rose, and so I put a rose in the middle and it turned it out. It turned out looking good. It's very nice. So, do you construct the whole piece, and then while it's all squishy and soft, then you... When not, um, how you do you, have to, I mean, do you put it all together like that, or I don't understand? Um, you want it to get kind of where it's still wet, but it's, um, it doesn't like, Move yeah. Um, we call it leather hard. Okay. So where it's movable, but it's not flimsy to where it will break into pieces or anything like that. And um, and then you just once you put it together, 
Um, you let it dry, let it sit out for a few days, and then I actually had a, I painted the middle piece and then put wax and then glazed the rest and then melted the, gla the wax off because <laughs> if not, the colors would have mixed, so. <laughs> That's just crazy to me. Yeah. It's kind of a long process, but it's fun. All right, so what other what other mediums do you work with? Um, I like to paint with acrylic also. Okay, yep. very good. Okay, um, if our viewers would like to get in touch with you, um, how do they get in touch with you? Like if they're interested in purchasing something or if they would like to see any of your other class projects or they say, hey, you're fantastic. We want you to make something just for me. Um, how do they get in touch with you? I have an email address. Okay. It's Melanie, M-E-L-A-N-I-E underscore Lintz, L-I-E-N-T-Z at Hotmail.com. Or they can follow me on Instagram. Uh, my name is um, M-E-L-O underscore, oh, sorry, wait. M-E-L underscore O, 1991. Okay. Yeah. Very good. All right. Good luck in the auction this evening. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Or Josh, tell us a little bit about the things that you have done. Well, uh, we've been a part of the Paul Farrell Memorial Art Auction now for a long time since I was in college, 2005, 2006, 10 years now, and um, here and there doing things. And I don't have any work in it this year, but we've been, um, I've been last year and this year I've done the graphics up there. So the two dimensional animations you see up there, okay. and the slideshow, but helping out, just helping out as much as possible. It's because you can't get away from it. You have to, you got to get in there you somehow. Know, You're like, hey guys, can I take out the trash? And that's Let's exactly <laughs> what we talked about when we first joined Images Art Club back in college is once you start, you're just not going to want to stop. Yeah. And that happened. I mean, we did the, the Dorm of Doom, which was fun, scaring things out of children. <laughs> and um, it was just... I don't know, the Images family always grows and new members come and go and those of us that are alum that can come back love to come back and when we do it's it's great, you know, Hector Cobo, seeing Clay, seeing a lot of the old the old OPSU alum, it's, it's fun. Alright, so you've done the slideshow, this, is, this kind of ties in with the business that you have. Right, yeah, yeah, we did this, uh, I guess there's a few slides up there that say PC Hut on there, so we did do it part of PC Hut. Um, of course, that's part of art marketing, that's what this whole auction is about, is to give them, all these students, the first step to get their marketing out there, to market themselves, to market themselves as artists, and market their, their artwork. And, you know, that was one thing that when Brian and I were talking about doing the slideshow, he said, make sure your advertisement's in there because that's what it's all about, is marketing yourself. And we're teaching these students that. And here I am, 12 years later, still utilizing the lessons I learned in college. Who would have thought I paid that money for that? Hey, it's pretty good. I'm telling you, OPSU yeah. is really pretty darn awesome. Yeah. You learn so much you can take with you. You'll never hear anything different from me, that's for sure. All right. The difference from this auction versus the first time that you participated or the first time you ever came to this the size the this one sold out yeah the notability i mean we don't really have to do too much to market this thing anymore everybody knows about it everybody is expecting tickets half of these people have been here and keep coming back since i was in school you know and it, the art just keeps getting better and i don't think that i didn't never thought that was possible and the, the uh, alumni participation is more diverse as well. Because it used to be, oh, the handful of guys that come back. And now it's like, oh, well, we have too many alumni <laughs> coming back, you know. So 
uh, so they kick you guys to the side. That way, the students can go ahead and show up their right. stuff. And it's now more of a well-oiled machine. I don't think it used to be this easy. I mean, like it's I didn't even have to lift one of these the tables this time. <laughs> and that's the first time in ten years I haven't had to lift any of these tables. So <laughs> it's nice having volunteers. And this year's artists are phenomenal. They were all here last night. They were all here setting up. And that's sometimes a difficult task. So, yeah, it's been nice. All right, words of wisdom for our viewers who may be budding artists. Let's go ahead and narrow it down just a little bit. The budding artists. Um, when I was an artist, I was a rebel. And artists tend to be rebels. And you tend to not listen to your professors. And you tend to not care about selling out. You don't want to sell out. You feel like marketing yourself and marketing your artwork and asking someone to buy a piece of your artwork is selling out. But you have to swallow that pride and face the facts that it's not selling out. If you do want to be an artist, you have to sell yourself. You have to find that niche and you have to find that crowd that you're going to paint for. You know, just like a musician finds that group of people that they're going to get on stage and perform for, and that's their fan base. You've got to find your fan base as an artist. It's like that for any form of art. That's very enlightening. I've never heard that before. Very yeah, good. Yeah, I just pulled that, that out. Was, so. That was wisdom. <laughs> Josh Setzer right here. He said it. Yeah. No, very good. All right. Well, um, thank you. Thank you for your participation. It's awesome. Even if it's a, a small contribution, it's still a contribution to well, make this event And thank fabulous. you guys for coming out here and filming it and making this even more It was sold out. This is the only way we could get in the doors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. That's how I got my staff badge. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank All right. You. Our last interview, our last artist this evening is Tim Zink. Tim, tell us where you're from to start with. I am actually, I went to high school in Hooker, Oklahoma. Okay. I was originally from Missouri though, and that's where my parents are now. In Missouri, they, they dropped yeah. you off and then they went back? <laughs> no, they moved back there and I decided I wanted to go to college at OPSU because I'd heard about the art program over here, the program. That, see, that was my next question, why OPSU? The art program, I heard that they had art marketing, which is, we put this all together tonight. I mean, we had a lot of help, but we planned the whole thing. It's art marketing class. and. That's where, that's why it was, there's not very many colleges that actually teach art marketing because a lot of the colleges say, you do art for art and you shouldn't try to sell it. And it's, well, you gotta make a living like, at how it. Do you, how do you yeah, make you gotta a living? sell it, otherwise you can't keep doing it. It's the only way to pay for it. So art marketing, what kind of things do you guys learn in there? Because you're the first person to actually use those words, art marketing. We learn everything from, we were talking about how to shake someone's hand for like contracts. You put your hand up and it's dominant. Or if you're trying, someone wants to buy something from you, you put your hand down, it shows that they're dominant and it gives them the lead and it makes them feel more comfortable. And it's just little things like that. And we're gonna put together on websites, we're gonna, we put together the press releases that went out about this tonight. We put this all together. We built big sculptures, all kinds of stuff. I mean, they teach you how to hang your art, how to display it so that, and then a lot of it's just trying to get contacts into the art world. Okay, See, so for art marketing, is this something that just, not an artist, but someone who's like, oh yeah, so I think I want to work in an art gallery one of these days. So this is something that we could do. I mean, if we yeah, were interested Yeah, it would in actually that. help out a lot. It's a really hard course, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it's challenging. It, it's gotten more challenging as the years go by because, well, with Facebook and Twitter and all that technology going, you have to stay relevant, otherwise you disappear and that's, so it gets more and more rigorous as it goes by. Not to mention, this whole thing has gotten a lot bigger than when it started. I mean, it just grows every year. We sold out a week before the event actually happened, and that's the first time that's happened. Yeah, that's, that is super exciting for yeah. you guys. That's really exciting. So, it's a lot. All right, so <laughs> with um, with art marketing, you know, because we're still, yeah. still thinking about that. Whenever you're trying to promote yourself, I mean, how do you, with social media and all of these, I mean, it, is it is it more difficult with social media to help you promote yourself, or is it easier? Is that like well, oh easy peasy? It breaks down to the generations of people, and there's like the baby boomer generation. They're big on Facebook, but they're not big on Facebook for games and all that. They're big with getting in touch with people that they used to know. Right. They found Facebook, or yeah, Facebook, and they were like, oh, I remember Jimmy back from like you know. 1967. Yeah, and <laughs> so they can outreach and get back in touch with people. So it's trying to market to those people and then there's the X generation that's between them and now and 
they're like the people who are just now getting on their feet. Like, they're not just now getting on their feet, they're just now where they're at a career level. And from what Brian says, we have a lot of Generation Xers here tonight, and that's the first time that's actually happened in a long, like, at all, because they, this is the first time they're old enough to have disposable income, pretty much. Right, so you're not really marketing, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all of this stuff for the younger generation. You're not looking it's for 18-year-olds. It's not for 18 the 14, olds. 18. It's for the people who are in, yeah, their that are 30s, set. 40s that have money <laughs> that can actually, because the art community is made up with, of people who have money to to buy pretty things that they like, not just, oh, we got to pay the bills, and then we have the car payment, and then we're broke, and then we have this much for food, you know? Looking yeah, I'll give you a call when I get to that yeah, point. <laughs> yeah, I know exactly how that is. That's where I'm at right now. <laughs> You're a college student. That's part yeah. of it. You got to have the struggle. I eat ramen many nights of the week. It's not a bad thing. Uh. All right, so tell us about the pizzas that you have here because you're the first. What are you? What is it? Are you silversmith? What do you call yourself? Yeah, this I call myself a silversmith. Uh, the name is Zinc Sterling, and uh, that's my last name. And just Sterling because I work in silver. I don't do a whole lot with gold. My dad does lapidary, and he actually taught me. Like, I taught my girlfriend how to cut rocks. Actually, she cut the one on my ring. And my dad made this, and this is like, it's a broken opal, but it's like, it's where it all started. This was the first ring that I ever got from my dad, and I just keep it. And I do a lot of stuff in similar designs, you know, I made the turquoise, and this is malachite. Alright, you said lapidary, that's the lapidary stone. Lapidary is cutting stones. Okay. And then silversmithing is, this is fabrication, not casting. What that means is, instead of carving wax and then casting it, I take wire and I bend it and I shape it like on this one. I made the band and I hammered it to give it its texture. Okay. And then I took textured wire and I wrapped it and did the shaping to make the eye. And then I actually used bezel wire, which is what you usually set stones in to make the eyelid so it goes in and looks like an eyelid. And then the stone set in the very center. This took probably six hours to make. It takes a while. It's intricate. You say a while? Six hours? What? Yeah, it doesn't seem like it. it people are like, why do you charge so much? Like, why would it cost that much? It's because there's a lot of time goes into it. That bracelet took double what this ring did. So does your dad provide you with the stones? He or cut do you that get... opal and he cut these two lapis. Okay. So this... what are the stones in this one? This is lapis lazuli and oxblood coral. Uh, oxblood's one of the better corals. It's now there's red corals not harvested anymore because it went on the endangered list, I think. So now they use a lot of bamboo coral, which is bamboo that's died, or they use pink coral or tan coral, salmon coral. They, there's no real reds anymore. And this oxblood actually comes out orange more than red. And then this lapis lazuli was bought from Rio Grande, which is where I get most of my silver, because they have satisfaction guarantees, and they quit using chemicals, like I can solder indoors with this, whereas normal soldering with a lot of other companies, they still put, I can't think of the name of the chemical in the solder that may, helps it run. It gives you cancer and kills you really quickly. Not a good thing if you're an yeah. artist working with it. Or it'll give you silver poisoning and your skin will start turning purple. <laughs> from That's inhaling so cool. it. And right. then, so why did you choose these stones? Are the, is there a significance these behind lapis the stones? These lapis were going to be earrings originally, and I thought they were going to be too heavy. Uh -huh. And so I wanted to go with, I, I've been trying to get into more Southwestern styles. And I mean, my, this was, actually I did this at the beginning of the semester. And all of these have been made since I got to college. I mean, I knew how to do it somewhat, but I haven't had a lab that I could just sit down in and put hours of time into design and everything since I got to college, and that's probably the best thing that's happened in a long time. And, well, I'll uh, get to that in just a second. Tell us about this necklace. The necklace? Okay, this silver nugget's not natural. I accidentally made it. I was using a fire brick as a crucible, and the powder in it is made of silica, and it bonded to the silver and made a crystal, which is hard as rock. I was hitting it with a hammer and does not dent. Like wow. it, I had to cut that down with silicon carbide wheels. It was hard. And I rounded it, and that's all I could get it to do. And I set it in there. And then this is two pieces of opal and a piece of turquoise in the middle on top. And looking at it, I call it the silver nugget is what it's called. But looking at it now, it really looks like a fertility goddess now that I think about it later. <laughs> Dang it. Is it too late to change the name before you sell it? It is. They're going to sell it as silver nugget. So. That's OK. Now, as a silversmith, this is not something that, I mean, this is not a class that they offer over OPSU, is it? They offer jewelry making, and it has okay. grown year by year. 
they remember Yvonne could tell you there was a time when they were literally, the budget was so low, they were doing like uh, noodle pictures on paper, like little kids doing kindergarten. And it's grown drastically. Now we have casting units and we have kilns and we have our own silversmithing kiln, which is awesome because that's how you harden the silver afterward. Otherwise, it's real flexible and it bends and breaks. So is the silver... Is, is that kiln different than the ceramic kiln? The ceramic, yeah, because if you put silver in a ceramic kiln, the oxidation from the silver will actually soak into the brick and change the atmosphere in it. And the ceramic won't fire the same ever again. It might be a good thing, might be a bad thing, but it'll never be the just same. don't try it. Just, it. <laughs> everything you put in a ceramic kiln changes the, the atmosphere inside. But whereas the silver kiln, Brent uses them to temper his knives in it all the time. It doesn't matter. It's just for heating up metal to certain points, holding it, and then doing it again, and then dropping it back off so it's hard. Okay. So, since you've been over there, what kind of things have you, what kind of things have you done? Because we talked a little bit before the interview, and you told me that you've even kind of helping them out, teaching them a few things. Well, yeah, the, the soldering was a problem they had had in years past, which is why they hadn't done much uh, fabrication. And I knew a lot about soldering. So, and actually their only problem was they were using the wrong flux. They were trying to use the white borax flux, which is what you use for annealing silver, which is softening it. You're supposed to coat it in that and then heat it up so that it doesn't build up black fire scale. And that's what that borax flux is for. The mighty flux is a self-pickling acid flux that if you get it on you, it'll, if it's cold, it's not bad. If it's boiling, it's really bad. It'll eat through your skin. It's one of those weird things. And that's how silver is. You gotta pickle it and it has to be hot. The acid has to be hot, otherwise it doesn't do anything. So it's safe to put your hand in cold, not hot. And it'll give you chemical burn and stuff. But their only problem was their flux was off. That was the only thing they were having a problem with. So how did you learn this stuff? Because most people come to the university to learn. Yeah. And it seems as though you are using the university setting to hone your skills. Exactly. When I was about eight or nine, my dad was in Kingman, Arizona. We were living over there. And he wanted to take classes in silversmithing. It was something he always wanted to do. He still has his first spoon he made. He has all kinds of pieces he's made. And this ring that I wear, is the first ring that he gave me and it has his initials in it and it's kind of the opal broke in it a long time ago but it's kind of a symbol of where i started so he did it and you know he's he's getting up there at his age and he can't cut the rocks as much anymore so he taught as much as he could to me so that i could do it myself if i wanted to and it's something i always thought was cool but i didn't have the money to really get into it till i started college actually it's, Everything You're eating I, ramen. How do you have money now? <laughs> I have a job that pays me once a month. I don't buy a lot of food and I buy a lot of silver. That is perfect. That's that is how brilliant. I pay for it. That is brilliant. I have silver in my car right now that's for uh, Emma Ray's necklace I'm making her. And I mean, it's just, I buy when I can and I skimp on everything else. That is such an artist thing, isn't it? Where you, you buy the stuff for your craft and yep. you just... And you're like, oh, forget everything I else. I can eat at my friend's house. I can take my clothes to someone else's house and do laundry. I don't got to take it to the machines and pay quarters. I don't got to buy a lot of food. And I mean, I always keep just enough money for gas aside, and I spend everything else on usually silver, to be honest. That is it so really awesome. Is. <laughs> Make and sure you fill up here tonight. Yeah. No, I just filled up yesterday. Gas okay. is cheap. No, which... I'm thinking the food. Oh, yeah. Eat. Fill up your pockets. Grab your girlfriend's <laughs> purse. Dump right. it in there. And I mean, gas is cheap now. I guess that's bad for the oil field people, and I understand that. It's good for people who can't afford stuff, though. So it's kind of scales tip back and forth. It's whatever. It is. All right. Um, for the viewers that, because this is going to air, you know, after the auction is over, obviously. Yeah. So if we have viewers that would be interested in contacting you to either purchase a piece or have you create a piece for them, how do they get in touch with you? They can get in touch with me at my email, which is zinc tim z i n k t i m all lowercase period sterling at gmail .com. Okay. Or my phone number is 580-754-3040. All right, well, good luck in the auction tonight. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I think that necklace would look great on you. you I should. think it would look fantastic I think that's on something me. you should think about in the next couple hours. All right, that wraps it up for this episode of Inside OPSU. We have had a great time, and it's been a very good learning experience for myself, especially because I know nothing about art. Talking to these students 
it's just so insightful and they're so delightful to talk to. Um, there is contact information like throughout the different interviews, so if you would like to get in touch with any of them, please feel free to go ahead and get in touch with them. I'm sure they would appreciate um, talking to other people about their art or even selling some, because you know they're all starving artists at this point. For PTCI Channel 2 and Inside OPSU, I'm Consuelo and I'll see you on campus.